Prayer is the key to build our Christian personality. Prayer is key to build a happy home. And also prayer is the key to the great revival. Every day, like a drawing person, try to gasp air. So I'm trying to gasp through prayer to receive more anointing from the Lord. Because uh, to meet the challenge of every day of my ministry, I need a tremendous amount of spirit person. If I don't pray, I can't carry out my work because I'm constantly under tremendous pressure and stress that my heart would be stirred up and I would lose the peace and then I will not have the joy and might and strength to carry out work with the Lord. People ask me a question, what kind of pressure do you have? <laughs> well, every day I should take care of 75,000, 750,000 members of our church. My main auditorium seat, 12,000 people. And then we have 20 satellite church, and each church has 5,000 to 10,000 members, and I'm preaching to them simultaneously with main auditorium congregation through satellite in Orovich. And also we made a sovereign church of another 15 satellite churches, which has 10,000 to 100,000 members and I chopped off the church and the congregation to my associate and the Senemite to take charge of the church. So we are actually carrying out the service through mostly television, through satellites. So we hook up to the satellite in orbit and through that we preach to the 20 satellite churches and 160 branch churches flung out throughout Korea, then to churches in Japan. And we also have 300 prayer houses. All the people and invalid people could not come to the church, so we made 300 prayer houses near to these people, and from 50 to 300 people are in prayer houses, having a simultaneous service through this satellite television. And area that we have internet church, we have internet broadcasting station, and most of the young couple are staying home, watching the internet having the service, because we have a parking space only for 5,000 cars. So more than that, we can't accommodate. So young people with children have a very hard time to find a parking place. They stay home, and they have service through our internet system. And after seeing the internet and having the service, then they send the typing offering by click, click, click. So we see all types and offering through clicking. And think of that, I have no way to visit my home, Christian's home and counsel with them and pray for them. Many people are having home trouble, children's trouble, business trouble, and sick. And they all want to have my personal contact. But I can't. So I found a way. Every morning I come to my office and I stay for two hours before internet. And the day send message through the internet and I answer back through the internet. And through the internet I pray, through the internet I consult, and through the internet I preach to them. So we have wonderful fellowship and home visitation through the internet. <laughs> and God has given in this age a wonderful instrument to use for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Practically, nowadays, I don't visit any home. 
Of course, I have no time to do that. But internet, through internet, every morning for two hours, I carry out all the home visitation, all the consultation, and I pray through internet for the sick people. And area that we have dormitories and dining facilities and everything. Every day, more than 3,000 people are up there fasting and praying. And so, I should oversee those set up. Then area that we have a big social work. We have technical college for underprivileged young people, those very young people. And we get them on the street, and the police station send them, men and women, and we clean them up, and we put them in dormitory, and we give them a technical education free of charge. So we are teaching them automobile repair, computer programming, architectural drawing, hairdressing, cooking, everything. And then when they graduate from our technical college, they become fine young men and women, good Christian, and they would go out and become a wonderful citizen. And that is also a burden and pressure for me raising the fund to feed them, to close them, to educate them. Then we also operate the senior citizens' home and also house for the senile dementia. So many people are senile nowadays around the world. And people are giving them up on the street. So we gather together and we wash them, take care of them till they go to heaven. And to do that, I should raise also a lot of money. And also, we are operating our daily Christian newspaper, which has half a million circulation every day. And it is not easy to publish newspaper daily. Because the uh, president calls us, Congressman calls us, and business people calls us, and ask us to add this article, ask us to withdraw that article. A lot of pressure comes from every part of society. But we are standing on Christian standard, and we don't compromise. So it's a wonderful Christian witness through a daily newspaper. And we are publishing the largest and the best Christian magazines and also weekly church newspaper. And area that we are operating, Hansei University, my wife is in charge of that, 3,000 students, and the Bethesda Christian University together. And I tell you, the budget is enormous, so I should try to raise a fund to relieve my wife of the headache. And then we have churches in abroad. We have 400 churches in USA. Actually, I've started 600 churches in America among the Americans, and 200 of them become rebellious and left me a few years ago. But still, I take care of 400 American churches here in the USA, and we have more than 100 churches in Europe, 50 churches in Japan, then we have churches in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and the countries of Africa, all over the world. And since uh, I've dispatched 600 missions around the world, constantly they are sending the message, asking me to send more money for the work. So I'm trembling when I receive the letters from missions Always they ask me to buy the vehicle for them, buy some home for them, send more money for the education and so forth and so on. So tremendous pressure. Area that we have a one beautiful university in Chinkent, Kazakhstan. It's an Islam country. But we built a beautiful Christian university. By the mistake of government, they issued the, uh, the license for Christian church to come and start Christian university. Uh, 
and the many Islam from the Saudi Ameri Africa, you no know, Saudi Arabia, and Middle East are coming there to receive education. So they envisioned in our school for computer programming and technical teachings and so forth and so on. And naturally, when they finish the course, they become Christian. So we praise the Lord. Yeah. And we are publishing a enormous materials, publishing house for the materials for Sunday school and cell leaders. We have almost 50,000 cell leaders, and they are wonderful people. They are just common lay men and women, and well trained. And they open their home, and they gather together five persons, and they have service every week. And this five cell will become a district cell. So they make their own home, spiritual home, through the cell meeting. They call each other's first name, and they have a real intimate fellowship. Because when they come to church, they are just one number in vast crowd. They feel lonely, uncared. But when they go to the cell, they call each other by first name, and they are taken care of. So cell ministry is very, very wonderful. Without cell ministry, I don't think I could have taken care of all of these numbers of Christians. So there, we are publishing a lot of the know-how books to the uh, cell leaders. Then we have various educational systems for the church members, school for the young people, school for the new married, school for the husband, school for the wives, and school for the older people. We have various grades of school, and we're constantly educating the people. And to do that, we have an institution of the full gospel study with about 20 PhD scholars, and they are full in charge of this education. And more than anything else, full gospel businessmen's fellowship. Wonderful, wonderful fellowship. One of uh, the head leader, Kim Sun Be is among us here. He's going to lecture after me, I guess. 50,000 business people, and most of them are millionaires. Beautiful, wonderful. And you know, all of them are serving God through mission. We have American mission, European mission, China mission, Southeast Asia mission, Islam mission, and African mission, mission for the entertainer, mission for the scholars, mission for the uh, police, mission for the school teachers, mission for the bankers. We have vast missions, and all of these missions are belonging to each mission, and they pray for them, they witness to them, and they, they receive offering from them. So that's wonderful. You know, Gospel, Gospel Business and Fellowship is enormous organization, and we love them. Then we have Non-government operation, good people. Through this non-government operation, good people, we are helping so many people in Africa. We are sending tons, thousands of tons of clothes, food, medicine to Africa, Asia, and North Korea. So far in North Korea, three million people have starved to death. And this year, five million children are dying from tuberculosis because of malnutrition. You think of the leader who will not take care of their people. This uh, prime minister of the North Korea is only thinking of the militarized the country. He's spending all the money to develop the missiles and the atomic bomb. He is nonchalant about the death of his people. There are no human rights, no any freedom to move around. Especially, it's terrible for the older people and younger children. They need a traveling license to move from this town to another town. Young people are moving around at night to get the food, but it's older people and the children, they cannot move around, so they just sit down there and starve to death. And so through our 
NGO, good people, we struggle to send clothes, food, medicine. This year, we are scrambling to send $10 million amount of the medicine for tuberculosis. Then beautiful organization we have with CGI, Church Growth International. Through Church Growth International, every year we are inviting thousands of ministers around the world to come to South Korea to share the Church Growth secret principles. And through this, we have developed a tremendous circle of the friendship among the successful pastors. So, since I should carry on all of this work, I need a special anointing, and usually I would pray for five hours every day. I would wait upon the Lord. Nowadays, I become a little lazy, and my knee is painful, so I would kneel down and pray for three hours. But actually, every moment, I'm spending my days in the mood of the prayer. Constantly asking God to anoint me. Constantly fight against the hindrance of devil. And through God's anointing, I can carry out this work. And God showed me the way how to pray. Many people ask me questions, how could you pray for five hours? What do you say? <laughs> through the CGI conference, when I invite so many American, European pastors, I would take them to prayer mountain. And I bring them to a prayer room and close the door and say, you can't move out of this door before you pray one hour. So, so let's start. And about five or ten minutes, American or European pastors, they pray fervently, but after that, they sit around and just only say, hallelujah, hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. Because they have not learned the technique of prayer. In prayer, you need technique. You see the soldier, when they enlist in the boot camp, they learn the technique how to fight. Soldier can become soldier without receiving training. So in prayer, you need training and you need to learn technique. So. God has helped me to develop many, many techniques. I say that the prayer jogging course, 30 minutes prayer jogging course, one hour prayer jogging course, two to three, then marathon prayer jogging course. You can pray all night. But still, you would have many things to speak. People, they just become, they run out of the language or they become tedious, so they can't keep on praying. But the most important prayer that God taught me is the tabernacle prayer. You know, I need to pray very effectively so that I may receive all the anointing that I need for that job. So one day, while I was lecturing in Taiwan, in a split of second, God showed me the revelation about tabernacle prayer. And since that time on, until now, decade after decade, I've been praying in this uh, tabernacle prayer. And whenever I finish tabernacle prayer, I would receive enough anointing to carry out that day's burden. So tabernacle prayer is so effective and so precious. And I, this evening, I want to share about tabernacle prayer. When Israelite was coming through the wilderness led by the Moses, God asked Moses to build the tabernacle, which he saw on the Mount Sinai. And when he built the tabernacle in the wilderness, then God commanded all Israelites to come and worship God only in the tabernacle. So in the tabernacle, God was dwelling and meeting people there. And when you see the, the tabernacle, they, it has a many kind of the uh, scenes through which they could uh, worship God. But now we don't see the tabernacle, but the Bible says we are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And our spirit is analogous to the Holy of Holies. Our mind is analogous to the holy place. And our physical body is analogous to the courtyard. So we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now we don't need to go to wilderness to find the tabernacle. We don't need to go to Jerusalem to find the Solomon temple. You are the tabernacle. And the God who dwelt in the tabernacle and the Solomon's temple now dwells in you fully. And he is in the Holy of Holy of your being, your spirit. And the Holy Spirit works from your spirit, through your mind, the holy place, through the courtyard, your body. And God manifests his glory through your being. So as the high priest and priest worship God in the tabernacle, so ye are the priest now unto the Lord. Each of us, we are the priest. So we don't need to worship God through our representative. We are priests and we can directly worship through the temple of our body. So every day in early morning prayer meeting, I, in my imagination, come to the courtyard. And as soon as I move into the temple of, of the courtyard, there I find the brazen altar. On the brazen altar, Israelite, they would offer the sin offering, trespass offering, burnt offering, thanks offering, or offering of uh, reconciliation and so forth and so on. But all of those offerings represent our Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, Calvary. So I come in my imagination to the brazen altar of the cross of Calvary and I see Jesus and I see the redeeming grace flowing out from Calvary. I say, dear Jesus, through your sacrifice, through your shed blood, my sin has been forgiven. I have been declared as righteous, and I can now enjoy the glory of God. With God, then we once again experience the Shekinah glory come and dwell in us. So I say, oh dear Jesus, through thy blood, my sin has been forgiven completely, and I have been declared as a righteous person, so I can enjoy this glory in you. I thank you, dear Jesus. Then I say, dear Jesus, through your blood, you have conquered the world and the devil. And now, through the blood, I can have sanctification and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I claim the sanctification. I claim the fullness of the Holy Spirit through the blood. Dear Jesus, through the blood, Give me the sanctification. Give me the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Then I look, to, look up to the Christ hung up on the cross again, and I say, dear Jesus, you took my infirmities and carried away my sickness. Bible says, by his stripes ye were healed. So I am healed. Since 2,000 years ago, legally speaking, I have been healed through your sacrifice. And sickness is illegal. Because it is, Jesus Christ already paid the price for the healing. So I claim the healing. You know, many people are only pray for the healing when they become sick. But if you pray before you become sick, you will never get sick. So I say, oh God, I claim the healing, divine healing to go through and through me so that I will not get sickness. Then I look again to the cross and I see the redemption from the curse. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Bible clearly says the Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs up on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon Gentiles. So I said, God, I'm a blessed person. I will never live on the thorny patch. I'm a blessed person. Jesus took my curse 2,000 years ago. So I am not under the curse of the law. I am under the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I say, God, I am blessed personally. My home is blessed. My ministry is blessed. And my work is blessed. And I am the source of the blessing to others. 
and I rejoice and I take away all poverty consciousness. So many people are unsuccessful in their life because they live in poverty consciousness. Unconsciously, they are controlled by the poverty consciousness. But I get rid of them all while I worship Jesus. Jesus, I am completely redeemed from the curse and the poverty. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was rich, but he became poor for you, so that you may be rich in Jesus Christ. You are even redeemed from the poverty. Well, don't reprimand me saying that you are preaching the prosperity gospel. You know, I'm bound to preach about prosperity gospel because Jesus Christ redeemed me from curse and the poverty. When your mind, when your mind is cloudy with the curse consciousness and the poverty consciousness and the failure consciousness, then your life would be fully occupied by curse and poverty. Pastor Frank asked me if I could tell how to become a millionaire. <laughs> but I tell you, I was making Korean people to think in terms of the freedom from the curse and the poverty. I was preaching to them and clearing their mind and let them see the cross of Jesus Christ and redeem completely in their mind and thinking life. And as a proof, when you come to Korea, I'll show them to you. They are all well-to-do business people, tremendously successful, giving the tens of thousands or millions of dollars to the Lord's work. Because God has blessed them. I'm not just talking grandiloquently. I'm not babbler. I'm telling the truth because I've experienced in my ministry for 45 long years. And so I say, oh God, through Jesus I'm redeemed from curse and poverty. I'm a blessed person. I'm enriched and I'm abundantly blessed. And so I'm constantly want to share this blessing with others. And I worship Jesus in such a way. Then I look up to Jesus once again as Jesus, through your blood, I've been redeemed from death and hell. Through your death, I die together. Through your resurrection, I have resurrected again. And through your ascension, I've been ascended to the right hand of God. So, God, I love you because even though I'm staying in my physical body in Korea, but spiritually, I have been resurrected together with you and I have been seated on the right hand of God, right now. So I say whenever I get out of this physical body, in a split second of moment, I will be on the right hand of Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. So, oh, I worship Jesus looking to His cross, our bronze, brazen altar, and I see the redeeming grace flowing down to me and make me righteous, holy, healed, blessed, resurrected. So through repeating that prayer over and over again, I renew my mind. Because I, while I was living as an old man, as a child of Adam, my mind was so clogged up with a curse. I was having the sin consciousness and the filthy consciousness, unholy consciousness, and sickness consciousness, and defeatism consciousness, and death consciousness. My mind was totally de devastated by the devil and sin. But through Jesus, a new person, whosoever in Christ Jesus is a new creature, all the things has passed away, lo, all things has become new. So I renew my mind, worshiping Jesus, kneeling before him, looking to the cross, then, through that prayer, I strengthen my faith. I become very strong. I say, I'm righteous in Jesus Christ. I'm righteous. I'm holy, sanctified. 
I've nothing to do with the filthy things in the world. By stripes I am shield. I am shield. I'm not under the control of the sickness. I am a blessed person. God is pouring out his abundant blessing in my life. And I've been already resurrected together with Jesus Christ by faith. And glory of God is mine. And so through that worship session, I strengthen my faith and also I clarify my vision. Many people do not have clear vision. But through cross of Jesus Christ, I see my new person clearly in my vision. I see myself in my vision dream, the new person in Jesus Christ. That is me. That is me. So affirm my new identity. Many people are having an identity crisis. Many Christians, they have identity crisis. I say, who are you in Jesus? I don't know. My pastor knows. <laughs> if Christians get out of the identity crisis, they will become a tremendous tools of God. We have no identity crisis because through blood we have been transferred from the sin to the righteousness. We have been transferred from the world and the devil to the Holy Spirit, to the throne of God. We have been translated from sickness and disease to the health and healing, translated from the poverty and the curse to the blessings and, and the Abrahamic blessings. And we have tremendous experience of the having the citizenship in the glory. So we have no identity crisis. We should have a clear identity in our mind every second. And whatsoever things come against our identity, you should rebuke and cast out. Many people are so confused that they accept whatsoever comes upon you. When they will try to deliver wrong kind of the package, you should compare with your new identity. And if that does not identify with your new identity, you must say, you devil, get out of my place with your package. Do never sign your package every time. People, when devil comes and bring the all kind of the package, they sign and accept it. Thank you, devil. Goodbye. So every day I am renewing my mind and every day I am strengthening my faith and clarify my vision and affirm my new identity when I kneel down before our brazen altar, the cross of Jesus Christ. And when I see his sacrifice and blood, oh, I thank Jesus, I worship. And it, it can take 30 minutes and one hour like that. Just kneeling, meditating upon this beautiful, wonderful blessing. Boy, this will change your whole feeling. When I finish that phase of the prayer, I feel so elated, so uplifted. I feel like jump up and dance. <laughs> Japanese people are very somber people. They are acting very cautiously, but very somber. Even Japanese church, they are worshiping very silent. But when I went to Japan about decades ago, all of these past Christians were so happy, and they were clapping and jump up and dancing. So I said, oh, what has happened to you? Where did you learn this? It's from Dr. Iverson. <laughs> oh, they become happy Christian. Singing, clapping, dancing all over. So right away I also pick up their way of the worshiping God and I try to dance and shout and release myself in free praising God. Isn't it wonderful? So brothers and sisters, let's come to the temple of the Holy Ghost your body, through your imagination, come to the courtyard and have worship before the brazen altar. Then after when you finish there, then you are going to uh, labor the water basin where the priests wash their hands, feet and face before they enter into the holy place. 
And this lever is made out of the looking glass. Those days, they didn't have this glass. They used the looking glass by bronze. They rubbed and made shine, and finally they made a looking glass. And, and Moses gathered together this looking glass and pounded it out with a bronze glass and made a lever. So, before the priest enter into the holy places, they look through the lever. Their, their, their whole future is reflected by that lever. And they make the hair neat, and they wash face, and wash hand. So when I come to the labor, I reflect myself there if I have anything wrong in my life. So in my heart, I visualize the Ten Commandments, which is my labor. So I speak Ten Commandments one by one. Do not worship another God. Do I worship another God? Before I become a Christian, I was born and raised up as a Buddhist. I didn't know anything about Christianity. In our town, there were no church at all. There was plenty of temples. So I was born and raised up as a Buddhist, and I was trained to chant prayer to Buddha. Day after day, my father and I would kneel down and pray and chant to the Buddha. My father was a very devout Buddhist, but I was nominal. So I follow after my father, chanting till I become spooky. It's <laughs> terrible. But when I was 17 years old, I was struck down with a tuberculosis. It was right during the Korean War. Our society was terribly broken down in great chaos, and we were living from hand to mouth. And I, because of malnutrition and hard work, I had a terminal tuberculosis. And the doctors told me that I would only live three, at most six months. So I came home. We had no money to receive any treatment, nor any means to go to hospital. So I was left alone, flat on my back, looking to the ceiling, counting the specks and spots on the ceiling every day. I had nothing to do. Vomiting blood, teeth running high, and I was praying to Buddha, Oh, Buddha, come help me. I've been such a faithful Buddhist for 10 years, and why don't you come and touch me? And I was begging and begging, but nothing happened. Finally, I wondered if Buddha went on vacation. <laughs> nothing happened. Or if he was out of the job. So I became a turn court before Buddha. I said, Buddha, now I don't know where you are. God, if there were God in the universe, would you come instead of Buddha? In less than one week, one Christian high school girl visited my home on her way from school to home, witnessing about Jesus, and she told me about Jesus. But I first was very rebellious, but she kept on coming day after day, crying for me. Finally, I was persuaded by her concern and love, and I began to read the Bible, and I found Jesus. Up until that time, I had never been to church. I had never heard any sermon. But because of the witness of this young girl, she left the Bible to me, then she would not come back again. So I read from Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and I said, well, this Bible would be like a Buddhistic Bible. I was well versed in Buddhist Bible. But Bible was so different. Bible was talking about one person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus who forgave sin. Jesus who cast out devil. Jesus who healed the sick. Jesus who fed the hungry. Jesus who raised up dead. And all of those wonderful work what Jesus was doing. Buddhistic religion is very logical, profound, philosophical. But uh, at that time when I read the Bible, the Bible was so practical and pragmatical. And I need a practical God, not a philosophical God. Because I was dying from tuberculosis. 
So one day I knelt down by myself, and I didn't know how to pray. So I said, Mr. Jesus, <laughs> if you are truly son of God, why don't you prove on me? I'm a young man, 17 years old, too young to die. You would get tremendous benefit out of me if you would ever heal me. <laughs> so I tried to make a bargain with God. If you would ever touch and heal me, then I'll become your servant, and I will go any place wherever you want me to go and preach. But suddenly I felt such a peace. Oh, that's... A, Unspeakable peace and joy flooded me. So I stood up. And I, I shouted, but I didn't know the hallelujah. I didn't know even one Christian song. So I shouted, something happened. Oh my God, something happened. Something happened. I was jumping all around. But later when I came to America, they were singing my poem. Something happened and now I know. That he touched me and now am saved. Wonderful song, but that I wrote that poem at that time. <laughs> I was jumping around and I saw oh, something happened in my life. Something happened. So God miraculously intervened in my life and delivered me from the another God, the Buddha, to our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Then I went to the Bible College, graduated Bible College in 1958, and since that time until now, for 45 years I've been in ministry, and I've never, never regretted that I have become a Christian. Jesus Christ has been the source of joy, happiness, peace, victory, everything. And uh, the tuberculosis never relapsed in my life. Christ healed me, and he finished completely. So when I pray before the labor, I say, Dear Father, I used to worship the other God, but no more, no more. I have only one God, our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Then secondly, do not bow down to the idol. Because we are not bowing down to the idol made by iron, or stone, or gold, or gems. But many times we are bowing down the idol of the money, power and special favored children, husband and wife, and so forth and so on. And it's very easy to fall in that trap. So I always say, oh God, am I loving my wife more than you? Am I loving my three sons more than you? Am I loving the name and the fame more than you? Please reveal everything to me, and I want to destroy that idol before you. Every morning, I'm searching my heart if I have any idolatrous love in my heart. And if I find anything, I confess. Then do not call God's name in vain. Of course, we won't call God's name in vain. But very easily, in a very naive way, when we say joke, we use the name of God. But even that is a very, very bad habit. Whenever I do that, I knelt before God and I confess all of those sins. Then also the Bible says, keep Sabbath holy. I say, now we are not keeping Saturday. We are keeping the resurrection day, the day when the Holy Ghost came, the Sunday. So I always say, do you keep Sunday holy? Well. Sunday we have seven services, so I can't help but keeping the Sunday holy. <laughs> no, but I really teach my people to keep Lord's Day holy. In our church, I am teaching very strongly to our people to pay tithe and keep Sunday holy before you try to receive blessing from the Lord. And our people give tithe. And amazingly, God opens the door of heaven and really bless, bless those people who 
give time. So when you want God to intervene in your business and life, more than anything else, these two things you must keep. Keeping the Sunday holy and give tithe to the Lord. Then Bible says, respect your parents. My father is 91 years old and my mother is 90 years old. And they are very old. And always I'm asking questions in my heart. Do you really respect and love your parents? You know, I've been busy always. I've been traveling constantly to Africa, Europe, the part of Asia, South America. And so I wouldn't have much time to share my life with parents. So that always condemned my heart. And I called by telephone and I ask forgiveness from the parents. But I give abundant material things to my parents so that they will not feel neglected. I buy a uh, car, and I supply chauffeur, and I supply uh, daily needs, and enough money to spend. So always I'm trying to do my best to respect my parents, because Bible command me so. And since I do that, my three boys are respecting me and my wife also very much. And because they see my life and my wife's life in their life. And so they make mimic out of my life, you know. So I'm very happy about that. And this is very important, very important. Well, I don't know American culture, but in Oriental culture, we are very near to our parents. And in older age, children must support parents. That is our uh, tradition in Orient. And if you neglect parents, then you will be ostracized out of our society. These traditions are fading away now by and by because of American television. <laughs> everybody watches American family way. But still, I am trying to teach our people to do their uttermost to respect their parents. Because that is command from the Lord. <laughs> and do not kill. We are not really killing. We are not manslaughter. But we are killing neighbor by hating. But I tell you, when you hate neighbors, you are programming your mind to hate. And when the hate programmed in your mind, that hurts you first before you do any harm to your neighbors. And so I say, for my own happiness, I don't hate. If I ever try to hate, then hate programmed into my mind, and that become a source of destruction to my personal life. So I say, I cannot hate, I forgive. I always forgive, and I don't try to kill neighbor by hatred. And that thing, I always take good care when I come and pray before the labor. Then do not commit adultery. Well, we are not committing adultery outrightly. Especially now in my age, the opposite sex is all same, like uh, men and women. But when I was a young man, it was not so. I had hot blood, and I had <laughs> temptation surrounding myself, and it was so dangerous. And this miracle that I have come through to this far safely. <laughs> so every day we should confess even the fancy things we play in our mind. People say, oh, it's not sin, it's just in my imagination. But devil sow the seed in our imagination, and that seed finally grows the fruit. And so, from my young time, always every day, I am praying to God to root out all the fancy imagination in my mind about opposite sex and cleanse my heart and make me holy. The Holy Spirit 
make you holy. And when you especially feel the presence of God, then you can commit adultery. You know, the Holy Spirit dwells, dwells in your body, and God present in you. And how can you commit adultery together with God? No way. Fear of the Lord is very important in Christian life. Many people do not fear Lord. They love Lord and they enjoy the grace and love of God. But they still should know that God is a fearsome God. When we have the fear of the Lord, then we will think twice and thrice before we commit sin. So there I pray, oh God, let me really have the fear of the Lord in my life and let me walk softly before you. Then also Bible says, do not steal. Well, I always say to our people, you may not steal openly, but you will steal something without getting any permission from your husband and wife and children and neighbor. Very easily we are stealing books. We are borrow books and read and put in our bookcase and we never return the books. This is very common case. Many of my friends borrowed books from me and very few of them ever returned book to me. When I visit their home, there I find my book in their bookshelf. <laughs> That's also kind of stealing. But more than anything else, we should never steal from God. We should not steal days. We should never steal the tithe. And we should be very careful about this. And when we steal, we should really confess. Then do not witness falsely. We are very, very easily witness falsely. You know, we tell tale among us so easily. And that is the worst scene in my life because when I meet ministers and when friends say, oh, did you hear a story about that guy, that ministers? Did you hear the story in that family? And something like that. And so on and on, all of those tell tale make me feel terrible. After that kind of talking, I feel smeared in my spirit. So every day I'm praying, oh God, help me not to witness falsely. And then do not covet your neighbor. When I was a young man, I coveted. Because when I, my wife and I were pioneering church, we were living in a poor tent church and we were uh, eating very coarse food. But neighboring people, they were driving a beautiful car having good growth and living a very abundant life and tacitly in my heart, I covet it. But now, I cannot covet because I can't become poor. That is my trouble. <laughs> in my mind, I can't find any space where the poor dwellers. Always I see my mind abundance. For example, brothers and sisters, Suppose I visit every one of my Christians, all of them want me to visit their home and stay at least one night in their home. Think of visiting 760,000 of them. <laughs> I will spend uh, many of my lifetime spent to visit and stay their home. They would give me best treatment, so I would not have any chance to become poor. <laughs> when I was young, we experienced plenty of poverty, but now, by the blessing of God, we can't become poor. I always say to God, Father, about 50 years ago, when I was coming from another city, Busan, to South Korea, riding the third class train, I was penniless, homeless, absolutely poverty stricken. But after 50 years, now look at me. I'm so blessed. I have a beautiful wife, very able, more talented than I am, beautiful three boys, good home, car, money, church, everything. And all of these things are from our Lord. God has blessed me. I've never worked anything for myself. God has blessed me so abundantly. God is a good God. God is an abundant God. Through my own experience. 
God has greater desire than you have to bless you. So actually, we don't need to live in coveting our neighbors because we would have abundance. In your life, if you give days and tithe to God, you are making that open space before God so that God could fill it. Many people do not have open space in their mind. All clothed up full with their own desire and uh, covetousness. But if you release your time, release your money, and make an open space before God, then God open the door of heaven and pour out his blessing upon your life. Amazing abundant life. Then after finishing that part of prayer, then I'm ready to enter into the holy place. I open the curtain and I walk into the holy place. And when I walk on the holy place right away, I see on the left hand the candlestick, seven branched candlestick shining. And that candlestick is symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is seven spirit. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, of fear of the Lord, of the holiness. So when I come to that part, I look to the Holy Spirit and dear Holy Spirit, through your anointing, give me your wisdom. Help me to solve the, all the problem through your wisdom. Oh, dear Holy Spirit, give me the understanding. Let me understand the deep truth of God so that I may give that uh, truth to our people. Heavenly Father, give me counsel so that I may very wisely solve my problem, problem of our Christian. And oh God, give me the might, tremendous might, so that I may heal the sick, cast out the devil, and give me the knowledge, knowledge of Bible, and give me the fear of the Lord, O oh God. Fear of the Lord. Let me be having a fear of the Lord, so that may I walk very softly before you, so that I will not commit sin. So God, keep the fear of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. Then give me the holiness through your presence. So I pray, and especially when you come to the Holy Spirit, you should know that He is the person. He is not some inanimate thing, cloud, rain, fog, or water, or something like that. This is just symbolic. The Holy Spirit is a amazing, the Holy Person, God's Father, God's Son, and God's Holy Spirit. In Old Testament, for 4,000 years, God's Father came forefront and worked. And behind God's Father, the Son Jesus and Holy Spirit in unity worked. But in the beginning of the New Testament, Son Jesus Christ came and He completed the redemption of human lives. Then when He ascended, then the time of Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. This is the age of the Holy Spirit. And He is dwelling in you in the church. And He is hovering upon this earth. And so through the person, Holy Spirit, we have living services unto the Lord. And so, you know, understanding the Holy Spirit's person is very important. In 1964, when I had 3,000 members, suddenly my church grows stalled. I pushed and pulled and I did everything, but church would stand still in the number of the 3,000. So I was crying to the Lord, Oh God, am I destined to have only 3,000 people? But no, no, it is not so. So after one early morning prayer meeting, it was very cold winter. All the people left and I was left alone in the corner of the church and I was praying and opening my heart, begging God to send more souls. Then I fell into sleep, deep asleep, and I felt I was in the presence of glory of God. Then I heard an awesome sound from the Lord. Do you want to see your church grow? I said, yes, Father. Then you answer me my question. God said, when Israelites were passing through the wilderness, if they had gone out to the wilderness to catch quail with bare hand, how many quail do you think they might have caught? 
I said with a bare hand, trying to catch the flying quail. I don't think they would have caught many quails, but they would have had a lot of the sunstroke. <laughs> then when I sent my wind, how many quail did they catch? Oh, the quail were falling like dust upon their camp. They gathered the bushes of the quail. You, how many quail did they catch? Oh, the quail were falling like dust upon their camp. They gathered the bushes of the quail. You are trying to win soul by your own strength and ingenuity. And you are exhausting yourself to death. Why don't you depend upon the Holy Spirit? The holy wind will blow the sinners into your auditorium. So I said, oh, but Holy Spirit, I know. I am born again by the Holy Spirit is dwelling me. I experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I even speak in other tongues. Yes, I have everything about the Holy Spirit. Then the awesome voice came. That is your trouble. You are treating Holy Spirit as an enemy thing. Don't try to make Holy Spirit an acrobat. He's a holy person. He has will, knowledge, emotion. You must be surrendered to him. And he should be your senior partner, senior pastor. You should not try to use Holy Spirit. I was so frightened, I walked out of my slumber. Right eye, where I rushed to my office and opened the Greek lexicon, and I looked into the word koinonia, the first Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, that the fellowship Holy Spirit may be upon you all. So koinonia was fellowship, partnership, unity. Oh, I love this. I treat the Holy Spirit not as a person, but some like an acrobat, try to use Holy Spirit. So I said, dear Holy Spirit, I confess my sin. Because of lack of my knowledge, I treat you as a impersonal. But you have been person all through these years. If I had ever treated my wife as I have treated you, my, my wife would have packed up and left me long time ago. Person should be recognized, loved, welcomed, and caressed. And the Holy Spirit is person. He has been with you in your life since you got saved. You should welcome him, love him, adore him, worship him as person. So when I understood the Holy Spirit is a definite person, I really confessed my sin before the Lord, treating Holy Spirit in a not right way. So I said, the Holy Spirit, forgive me from today on. You are my senior pastor. I'm junior pastor. I will not do anything without your permission. And from that moment, I said, Dear Holy Spirit, I welcome you. I recognize you. I worship you. I adore you. I depend upon you. Let's go, Holy Spirit. So every Sunday before I come to preach, I say, Let's go, dear Holy Spirit. And after finishing, I said, Dear Holy Spirit, thank you for your anointing. And even today, before I come up here inside my house, let's go, dear Holy Spirit. That has become my second nature now. The Holy Spirit is my senior pastor and my senior partner. To have a fellowship with any any things, you can't have fellowship. You can't have fellowship with dogs and birds, because no personality. But you know, to have fellowship, you should recognize and you should adore and love. My wife is a person, so I recognize her as a person. So I adore her, love her, and I say nice things about her. In other words, I would eat a cold breakfast. <laughs> so, when the Holy Spirit is recognized as a person, then you would adore the Holy Spirit. Love. You should say that. Every morning when I get up, I say, good morning, dear Holy Spirit. I love you, I recognize you, I adore you. Let's go together. Anoint me, dear Holy Spirit, and let's have partnership together with you. 
ministry and all the church works. You are the senior partner, I'm the junior. Let's work together. I wait upon the Holy Spirit till he definitely enlightens my heart and shows me his will. Then I try my best to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit, always living together with the Holy Spirit. So when I come to the seven candlestick, there I say, Dear Holy Spirit, I recognize you, I welcome you, I adore you, I love you, and you are my senior pastor, senior partner. Let's go today, let's go today. You please go ahead of me, I follow you. And since that time, suddenly something happened. When I come to preach, I felt another dimension of the presence of God and power. And the barrier of 3,000 membership were broken. And suddenly, my church began to grow to the 7,000, to the 12,000. Then I resigned from that church and we moved out to the Yedo Island. There we built that church. We sit with 12,000 people and we have 750,000 members right now. This is all the work of the Holy Spirit. I have not done anything. I was just looking on the work which the Holy Spirit was doing through me. So, after worshiping God in front of the, that uh, candlestick, then I come to the middle. There is the altar of incense. They have precious burning incense to God 24 hours. See the smoke of incense fill the holy place. Incense is the praise of the saint, so there I praise my father. I say, oh, father, you're omnipotent. You can do anything, and I will believe you. I will never choose fear and doubt. I will willfully choose the faith. Many, many things happen, but I can see God, but you are present with me, and I choose to believe you. I will never choose fear and doubt. You are omnipotent. You are omnipresent. You are always with me. When I was pioneering my church in the country, one uh, farmer's wife came to me and she said, Pastor, please give me the address of Jesus Christ. I want to write a letter to him. She was ex-Buddhist and in Buddhism, when she would go to the temple, she would see the, the, uh, the idol on the altar. She could address to the idol. But she says, I come to church and I don't see Jesus here. And show me the address. I said, I don't know his address. She said, oh, you are the servant of the Lord, still you don't know the address of your Lord? I said, I'm sorry, I have not known, but give me one week time, I'll find his address and let you know. <laughs> and I was worrying. I said, Lord, where are you? Bible says, God in heaven, where is the heaven? Glow, the, world, the, the earth is round. And the, those guys who live on top, heaven is there, down, heaven is there, side, heaven is there, heaven is there. Where is heaven? Father, where is heaven? Where is Jesus? Let me know the address. And I was praying, and one day I found the address of Jesus Christ. When I was reading the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 20, in that day, you will know that I am in Father, you in me, and I in you. I said, this is it. My address is the address of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so next Sunday when she came with notebook, I said, write down the address of Jesus. First, write down your address. So she wrote down her address. And this is the address of Jesus Christ. She was angry. It's, you are kidding. So I said, no, 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 I'm not kidding. So I opened the Bible and I let her read it. In that day you will know that I in my Father, you in me, I in you. So Jesus is in you. So where you are, there Jesus is. Your address is the address of Jesus Christ. He's there. When you are in the kitchen, he's there with you. When you are in the farmland, Jesus is there. When you go to the marketplace, Jesus is there. You just don't recognize it. But Christ is present there. He's omnipresent. And then she said, ah, now I can see. Jesus is with me. Yes, he is omnipresent. He is with you. His address is your address. Don't go everywhere under the heaven to find Jesus. 
He is as much here as he is in South Korea. So I say, Jesus, you are present with me, whether through the day, through the darkness, through the good light, and through the bad light. You are with me always together. You are the source of my life. Then I say, dear Jesus, you are omniscient. You know everything. You know everything. So you know my past, present, future. So I commit everything into your hand. And I will not worry. I will follow you. Jesus, you are omniscient. Then I said, create of the universe. You not only create the universe, but you are the great God, the eternal God, ruler of the world history. You know, in North Korea, they are worse than the communists. They have strange idea, Juche theory. Juche, they say that uh, the human being is the center of the universe. And human being create the history and control the fate of human life. It's antichrist. So I say, oh God, this guy says that human being is the center of the universe. But I say, God is center of the universe. And this guy is saying that human being create history, rule over the history. But no, God create history. Because history is his story, not human being's story. History is his story. It's your story. You make the history. You create history. You rule over the history. You rule over the human fate. So I worship you. You are greater than the communist. You are greater than the rule of the North Korea. Oh God, you take care of that guy. Well, he'll do it. American do not need to worry about that too much. Because we are praying. So as, as, at that altar of the incense, I send the praise and prayer of incense to God. Then when you turn to the right, there you see the showbread. On the table you see the 12 showbread. The showbread is a symbol of the word of God. I say, Father, thank you for the showbread, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Thank you for the lovers. And thank you for the rhema also. You know, there are certain differences between logos and rhema. Logos is a written word of God, and rhema is inspired word of God. When I was going to Bible college, uh, one woman evangelist was having tremendous success in evangelism. She was having a summer camp on the top of a mountain. Thousands of young people went there. And, uh, you know, many, many people were falling down before her. So, it was raining, and the river was all overflowing. And three girls, they wanted to come back down to the downtown, but they should cross over the river, and the river was overflowing with torrential rain. So three of them, they were very, very strengthened by the evangelistic meeting. So they opened the Bible and read the case of Jesus, uh, Peter walking on the water. And they said, oh, Peter walked on the water. Why shouldn't we walk on the water? We should not become a coward. We should walk through the water and cross over this river and go to downtown. And so these three girls made a scram each other and wade through the water. They were swept by the waves and their dead body was found in the open sea in three days. And all the mass media and the anti-newspaper wrote about that case and they said, where is their God? They sincerely believed. They sincerely prayed and believed in God. But why God could not protect them? Why God gave them up? And uh, oh, my heart was also very, very shaken because at those days I was not so much enlightened about the Bible. And many people lost their faith. And pe people made the church as a laughing stock. But later I found out the difference between the Logos and Rhema. 
these girls made, made mistake about Logos. Logos is a written word of God, potentially yours, not practically yours. Rhema is uh, the inspired word of God. God take the word of God, the written word of God, and make it alive and inspire into your heart as a present word of God to you. Specific word to the specific person at a specific situation. Peter never walked up on the water by reading the experience of Israelites crossing over the Red Sea. Oh, since Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, I would walk on the water. No, he requested Rhema, Jesus, if you were Jesus, command me to walk, command me to come. He asked the specific Rhema, and Jesus said, come. Only Peter walked on the water, not other disciples. So Peter received the Rhema, the specific word, to a specific person. And so he did not walk out of boat by the written word, but he walked out by the word which he heard from Jesus Christ. So these girls, they just waded through the world by the knowledge, not by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That word of God is Rhema, not Lagos. He, they walked on the water by the knowledge, and knowledge could not sustain them. But if they had heard Rhema, then God would have sustained them, because faith comes by Rhema. If they had received Rhema, they would have believed it. One of my disciples came to me and cried. He said, Pastor, you went out to Yedo Island with penniless, and prayed God, and God supplied millions of dollars to build this magnificent church. So I imitated you. If God could help you. Your God is my God. Your Jesus is my Jesus. If you could do that by believing God, why couldn't I do so? I borrowed a lot of money from bank and I built a big church and I'm in bankruptcy right now. He said, God is unfair. He is for you, but he's not for me. But I said, poor fellow, you made a mistake. I never went out to Yeido Island in 1969 by my knowledge about Bible, but God specifically spoke in my heart one morning in my office that your work is finished this year, rise up, go to another place and build a church. We sit with 12,000 people and send out more than 500 missionaries around the world. I heard from the Lord. That was not a written word, but that's hearing word. So I had faith. So I fulfilled through the many difficulty. But you just went out by uh, fake faith. You just went out by knowledge, not by faith. Many people make mis misunderstand about this loss and rhema. It's very, very important that to wait upon the Lord. You, when you wait upon the Lord, the Holy Spirit wants to inspire the logos into the rhema. Since I operate newspaper, I received many interesting stories around the world. And uh, several years ago, I received an interesting report from Africa. Some of our African brethren on Monday, they gathered together, they had a Bible study. They studied about uh, Peter walking on the water. So they were all elated in praising God, and a bunch of about 12 ministers, they chartered a boat and they entered into the lake and one, two, three, they jumped into the lake trying to walk up on the water and they all were drowned. That was news, came to our newspaper. And uh, many of the, the, the reporters, they looked to me, they said, how come? How come? Wonderful ministers, they believed and prayed, jumped into the water and they drowned. Why wouldn't God support them? Same situation, knowledge and inspired word of God, Logos and Rhema. When you hear from the Lord, you know about 7,000 promises are included in the Bible. All of those promises are potentially yours, potentially. But when you pray, surrender your life, God's Holy Spirit take the potential promises and inspire into your heart as a actual promises to you. In Korea, one 
brother. He had a child diabetic son, and uh, this uh, son was uh, having a heavy insulin every day to survive. But he came to my evangelistic meeting, and uh, he received a tremendous blessing, knowledge about divine healing. He was a new Christian, and he received all knowledge about divine healing. When I preach knowledge, I mean that he should go and pray and let the Holy Spirit turn the knowledge into the faith. Logos to the rhema, take time. But right away he went and he said, from now on, I'm not going to give you the insulin injection, I believe. Bible says so. So he didn't give injection to the baby, and the boy was twisting in coma and making foam in mouth, terrible. But he still say it's in Bible. Finally, they was found it and took the child to hospital, and he was saved his life by the skin of his teeth. But this guy come to me and cry. He said, "This God is unfair. God answers to you." But he would not answer to me. I said, brother, I'm waiting five to three to five hours every day before the Lord so that God may speak rhema to me. And when God speak rhema, I speak them. But I don't just casually go out and open the Bible and point finger and say, oh, this isn't Bible, and I claim it. It doesn't work like that. All the promises are potentially yours, but not practically yours. You should wait upon the Lord. You know, that is very, very important. Many people have uh, experienced a fiasco in their prayer life because they judge the lunch out by the lovers, not by Rhema. So when I come to the showbread, I said, Oh, dear Lord, thank you for the Logos. I, because without the Logos, you don't even have a Rhema. You know, Logos is like a rice, and the Rhema is like a cooked rice. It's different than rice and cooked rice. It takes Holy Spirit to cook the rice. So I said, oh God, thank you for the logos. But I need the Holy Spirit to cook the logos and make rice for me to eat. Praise the name of the Lord. Then finally, I opened the curtain again and go into the Holy of Holy, right directly in the presence of God. And there I see in front of me the Ark of Covenant. And the Ark of Covenant is covered with a gold plate, the mercy seat. And there you see the blood of the Testament. Once in a year, the high priest would bring the blood of animal and spray on the mercy seat. And through there, they receive redemption from the sin of the whole Israel. Now, on that mercy seat, we see the blood of Jesus Christ. And there I see the blood of Jesus, the blood of New Testament. Oh, blood of New Testament. And uh, there I worship the Lord and I say, Oh God, through this blood, the sins of the world have been redeemed eternally. The eternal righteousness has manifested. You know, when we see the blood of Jesus, that blood is assurance that Jesus Christ took the sins of the world completely. When Jesus said, it is finished, the Greek language is tetelestai, that's a commercial word, all the debts have been paid off. That's the real meaning of the tetelestai. So Jesus Christ paid off all of our past sin, present sin, and future sins. All clean, clean sheep. And through that blood, we have the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus. How much righteous you are, you are as righteous as God is righteous. Isn't that fearsome feeling? Human being could never accomplish that kind of righteousness. But we, through Jesus Christ, become God's righteousness. You are God's righteousness. This reason you come to the presence of God without feeling any bit of condemnation. 
That is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, the blood is the only answer. Nor any religion, nor any philosophy or ritualism. The blood is the answer. The blood flowed like a river through the Old Testament. All of the blood of animals. Those bloods point the reality. The blood of Son of God. The eternal blood. So, when I see the blood, I see the sin completely paid off and righteousness manifested. And I praise God for that wonderful blessing. Then again, I see the blood and I see the disarmament of the devil. Jesus Christ completely disarmed the devil. Devil is defeated enemy. Of course, he's going around like a lion, but it's uh, all shall I say, bluffing. People are bluffed by the devil because they don't know the truth when devil really bluff and people have fear and they become the slave. Fear is the means of the devil. But when we know the truth, the devil is completely denuded of principalities and power, disarm, dis, disarmed. And through the word of God, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we overcome. We are the overcomer. So when I see the blood, I say, oh God, I'm free from the fear of the devil. And I, through Jesus Christ, overcome the devil in every corner of my life and ministry. Then when I see the blood, I say, that blood is the annulment of the law. Law asks you to work. And through your work according to the law, you can never, never make righteousness. You feel always condemned before the law. But the blood, the now, the power of the law. The law has been disannulled since Calvary. Now, law is no policeman. The law is mirror. Now through Ten Commandments, we see the mirror if we have some, some smear on our face. And the law just help us to clean our face. The law is not there to intimidate us and to condemn us and to put us in jail. Law is annulled. And the, the, the role of the law is now to show us the way to please God. So I always look to the Ten Commandments. That is my mirror. As ladies carry the mirror in their handbag and always look into the mirror and, 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 and using cosmetics. So I always take out my mirror, the law, and look into the mirror and change my cosmetic. <laughs> so law is wonderful. The role is changed. All the role of the law is disannulled. But the law has now new role as a mirror to show us, to decorate ourselves properly to stand before God. So when I see the blood, I say, oh God, I'm free from the fear of the law. Then when I see blood, I say, no human works required for the salvation. Only believe. Only believe. Now, no human Achievement is required. So when I see the blood, I say, oh God, I thank you. This is a deliverance from the sin and the imputation of righteousness. This is the freedom from the fear of the Satan. This is freedom from the, 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 uh, the old, uh, law of Old Testament. And this is freedom from the human work. And I finally quote this scripture. I memorize this in Korean language. For by grace ye have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. Ephesians second chapter verse eight. I say, not of my work, it's gift of God. Total faith, total grace. Oh praise the Lord. Then I visited the temple of God from entrance to the last part, the presence of God. When I regularly pray this uh, temple prayer, tabernacle prayer, I can finish quickly in 30 minutes. 
And if I want to stay longer, one hour. And even more, I can stay two to three hours. And after that, when I come to the direct presence of God, then I pray ripple prayer. You know, I call it ripple prayer. When you cast a stone into the lake, you see plump, then ripple goes out. Ripple goes out. So ripple prayer is you pray from you, and it goes out from people to, near to you, and then others. So I pray for my wife first because she's tremendous, my helpmate. Without her, I don't know how can I manage my ministry. So I say, oh God, please help her make her live longer than I do. <laughs> so that she may take care of everything. <laughs> and uh, I pray God to impart more ability, strength and health. Then my children, then my parents then my brothers and sisters, then my elders and deacons. You know, I have 1,400 elders and 50,000 deacons. So you can imagine what a headache I have every day. <laughs> then churches, missionaries, and then Korea, then America. Every day I'm praying for Mr. Bush and America. Because in our generation in Korea, we are what we are because of America. Because I experienced the Korean War, our, our, uh, I was grown up during that period. But for America, we would have been dissipated a long time ago. Because communists came and played havoc on our country. And America came and delivered us from the communism, and from starvation, and from poverty. So in our generation, 50 years old beyond, all thank America every day. We appreciate you so much. And the only way to compensate is praying for America. But I, my heart is broken seeing our young generation, these young guys, they have an empty skull and they don't know too much anything. So uh, they demonstrate and they do all of these ugly things. And I was so angry in my heart. Right away I gathered together our Christian. I went out to City Plaza. I had a big campaign, 70,000, second time 100,000, the third time 200,000. And we, we was waving the Korean and American flag and we pray for Mr. Bush and we, we love America and all of those things. So I think we must pray for our leaders and for our government, and I feel such a keen spirit to you, you America, American people. I take it as a responsibility in my life to pray for the leaders of America and American people through the rest of my life. Then American church and my wonderful friend, like Brother Wender, he's a wonderful friend of mine, member board, and the Brother Pringle from Australia. He's a great man of God. He's a young man. I think he will do far greater work than we do. And God is going to use them so mightily. So, brothers and sisters, I'm always praying every day through the tabernacle prayer. When I go through the tabernacle, then I feel such a fulfilled feeling in my heart. I feel the satisfaction. I see the smiling face of God. I become so strengthened in my faith. And I move out and I become equipped to meet the challenge of that day. And I hope that you would also practice this tabernacle prayer in your life. Then you not wander around in your prayer life, groping for the words and always watching the, your watch. And you say, oh, I prayed quite long. Oh, only five minutes, oh my. <laughs> because you have not learned the technique of how to pray, but if you, make a jogging through this tabernacle prayer, then you will forget the time. At least, it will take more than 30 minutes. It's a great 
think to pray more than 30 minutes. You will feel tremendous anointing by having a, such a fellowship. Then one hour, three hours. And I asked my Christian to pray every day for one hour and my minister at least three hours. Because when Christ was praying in the Olive Mountain, then his disciples were asleep. Jesus said, can't you be awake for one hour and pray with me? Pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Then he repeated it three times. That means that Jesus prayed for three hours in Mount Olive at that day, Gethsemane. So I asked my disciples all to pray three hours every day. And that works. God's anointing flow like a mighty river through our disciples, through our church. My dear brothers and sisters, may God bless you very richly. God bless you. Thank you.